a little while about that. And the other thing is, as Michael was just saying, the uh, saliva driving tests, uh, a fair bit to say about that as well. And to some extent, the overlap between the two, maybe, we might get uh, a moment or two for that. So I'm not going to talk for an hour. Uh, I am going to talk for a little while in terms of a, a bit of a rave or a whatever. Uh, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. So uh, if you've got questions, Probably because there's two different topics, probably easier for me to just talk about both and then have the questions about either or both or all of them, or something completely different at the end of the talk rather than interrupt it. So if you don't mind, uh, just be a bit patient. If you get a question coming to your head during the uh, process, then just hang on to it for a second. And uh, if you could please, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, just hold your hand up. Uh, we have a microphone, a mobile microphone. Um, having been in this hall on I don't know how many occasions, uh, often people who are calling out from the back, whatever, think they can be heard, but just trust me, you cannot be heard throughout the whole room. Uh, it's a lovely hall, uh, great energy and everything else, but acoustics not so much. So please uh, just use the microphone uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, I think that probably the first thing, given it's a medicinal cannabis uh, focus, the first thing I probably should talk about is the whole subject of the legal status of medicinal cannabis and uh, everything around that. So let me just make the uh, opening statement by saying in New South Wales it is an offence, criminal offence, to use cannabis, possess cannabis, grow cannabis, supply cannabis, sell cannabis, agree to any of those activities, that's a criminal offence. The law is called the Drug Misuse and Trafficking Act and it is an offence under that law to have possession, for example, of any amount of cannabis. It does not matter whether the purpose of the possession is for medicinal purposes or not. It is not legal to use cannabis for medicinal purposes. It is not legal to grow cannabis for medicinal purposes. It is not legal to supply cannabis for medicinal purposes. Supply includes providing cannabis. So even if you're not getting any dollars in exchange for cannabis, you might give to someone who's uh, in need of it for medicinal reasons, you would still be guilty, well, take that back, you would be likely to be found guilty of the act of supply and be uh, and liable to uh, criminal penalties. The law does allow, where, where the flexibility comes in, if that's the right word, is that in medicinal cases, the penalty the person might get for any of those activities, possession, supply, cultivation, uh, would, would, could, should, uh, be reflected in the penalty. So if you're growing a crop uh, on a reasonably large scale to sell it to make a million bucks you, and you got busted, you would expect to spend a fairly serious amount of time of your life in jail as a result of that. If you're on a lower scale, a smaller scale, growing a few plants for medicinal purposes for yourself or for a loved one of yours, and the court accepted that was the motivation, then you may not go to jail, but you would be likely come back to the white, only likely, very likely, uh, to be still found guilty of that offence and uh, suffer a consequence. The consequence might be a good behaviour bond rather than a jail term, but it would still be a conviction likely, it would still be a blot on your otherwise perfect record, no doubt, and it would certainly be an absolute nuisance to you to have to go through the court system um, more than for more than one day, it's always more than one day, uh, and, and be uh, exposed to that kind of penalty and also have that uh, on your record. Probably more questions coming out of that, but that, that's, that is simply the law. Uh, it's not a good law, but it's the law. A week or two or three ago, the federal parliament passed a law which, according to some media reports, uh, was described as legalising medicinal cannabis in Australia. Uh, don't believe anything you read in the media, really. That is an absolutely incorrect statement. Cannabis has, medicinal cannabis has not been legalised. Medicinal cannabis was not legalised by the bill they passed through the federal parliament a week or two or three ago. What that uh, bill did was a very, very limited thing. It created a regulation framework, full stop. The federal government said, here's a law. If anybody else wants to pass a law, that is any state or territory, wants to pass a law to legalise medicinal cannabis, that's good, go ahead and do that. We're not going to do it. But if you want to do it, that's OK. But you've got to then fit into this particular regulation framework. There's got to be a degree of licensing. There's got to be a degree of a uh, fit and proper person test, that is, you probably can't have a criminal record to obtain a licence, for example, to grow medicinal cannabis. Uh, a whole lot of things in place. Uh, so the 
It's talk and only talk. At this stage, no state government, with the exception of Victoria, no state government has indicated that they are going to pass laws to make it legal to possess, grow, supply cannabis for medicinal purposes. So unfortunately, the good news story from the two or three weeks ago about the federal government legalising medicinal cannabis is uh, misunderstood. It is not that. It's a step in a direction, maybe not necessarily even the right direction, but it's a step away from the absolute prohibition of medicinal cannabis, but it does not, in fact, change any law. All it does is create a framework that maybe New South Wales one day might fit into, uh, and it's a little bit unclear whether New South Wales, for example, could pass a law about legalising medicinal cannabis under a different framework. My understanding of it is that they would have to comply and fit within the federal framework in order to, uh, for it to be constitutionally valid. The, just a couple of words about that. The federal government has constitutional power because they've signed international treaties, well, years and years ago. Um, and of course, the federal government has such respect for international treaties around human rights and everything else you can think of that they couldn't possibly um, breach any of their obligations there. But they feel very, very nervous about breaching any obligations under the um, Civil Convention and other um, anti-drug uh, uh, international treaties. So what they have said is, in this uh, bill two or three weeks ago, this is complying with our obligations under the international treaty. We, the federal government, have signed a treaty that says we will not allow uh, illegal drugs, including cannabis, and this is our way of saying, our, the federal government's way of saying, well, we, will, we, the federal government, will comply with that. We will allow our states to do it and we'll sort of supervise what the states do, but we ourselves will not be passing a federal law to make it legal, if that makes any sense. If New South Wales wanted to do it in a different way, if the, if the federal government wanted to worry about it, they might take the whole case to the High Court and have a, an argy-bargy match about which law would prevail in terms of a law in New South Wales against law in federally, but that's completely hypothetical at this stage. There is no law on the table in New South Wales. The only law passed by the Federal Bar Parliament is one that would allow other, other jurisdictions to pass a law. None of those jurisdictions have, and none of those jurisdictions are close to, with the exception of Victoria. I hope that makes some sense. Uh, second sort of broad topic, uh, and the dry, that's the driving. The law uh, was changed quite a few years ago now about to allow police to do random saliva testing of drivers for uh, to detect either THC, and it's best that it's THC and not cannabis broadly, it's THC or amphetamine or uh, ecstasy, MDMA, it's actually described as ecstasy in the legislation. So three substances. Uh, drawn from a range of other illegal substances, of course, the, the, the legal ones. So those three only are tested for. It's an offence to drive, or just, it's easier just to talk about THC because otherwise it just gets too clumsy. Uh, it is an offence in New South Wales to drive a vehicle, or sit in the driver's seat uh, of a vehicle, with THC present in your saliva. Full stop. It doesn't matter whether you intended to drive with the presence of THC, or not. It doesn't matter whether, it doesn't matter at all whether the, the presence of the THC had any impairment effect on your ability to drive. The law is simply a law that says it is an offence to drive with the presence of THC in your saliva. Full stop. The way they prove that is, as many people would probably know, a, a process of taking saliva samples from the driver, that they, the police, taking saliva samples from the driver, so three stages and uh, then the matter goes to court if you fail the stages. The first stage is at the driver's window, literally at the driver's window, uh, a, a, a swab, an indicator. That is, they take a smaller of your saliva from your tongue and the little blue line comes on or it doesn't come on and if the blue line is there, then that is a positive result and you are then under arrest, taken to either a police station or a, a um, specially equipped drug bus that have occasionally around the place for a second stage test. The second stage test is with a machine called the Dragar machine, that's the manufacturer's uh, name, Dragar, German company. They take a second sample, second saliva sample, they kind of plug it in a little bit, they put on a little stick and plug it into the machine. If the Dragar machine says, yes, this is a positive test to THC, the police give you a direction not to drive for 24 hours. If it is negative, 
the police say you're okay to go, as in you're not under arrest anymore, but they still send that sample, that same sample, that second sample, down to the laboratory in Sydney to, for a proper scientist to look at it and to see whether there is THC present in that sample. Okay? If that is positive, then there, you get a court attendance notice, you get uh, a summons basically to go to court and you are faced with the charge of driving with the presence of THC. Reasonably low level driving charge, but there is the consequence of, on conviction, losing your licence for a minimum of three months. Like I said, I said this more than once, doesn't matter if there's no impairment effect. Doesn't matter if you're driving perfectly fine, if the officer stopping you says in the paperwork, no obvious problem, no driving well, just random test. Uh, doesn't matter. That is in terms of penalty, but doesn't matter in terms of whether you're guilty or not guilty of the charge. What many, many, sorry, I should say, that law's been around for uh, how many years? Six, seven, eight years, quite a few years. Uh, what has changed recently, which is why there's many more of these cases now coming before the court, is the frequency, the number of tests they're doing has now skyrocketed. So instead of just the occasional, well, in this area, the bus would come up from Sydney from Mardi Gras, they might come up for the Blues Fest, they might come up two or three times a, a year, and maybe you know, 15, 20 people in the whole region might get busted. So it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a great thing, but it wasn't a huge problem in the sense that only a very relatively small number of people were being called out. What is happening now is, because they don't need the bus to put the Dragar machine, they've got the Dragar machines in pretty much every police station, then they are doing more and more testing, and more and more people are, are failing the test, as in proving positive, and more and more people are coming before the courts. Most of the magistrates in this area anyway are aware that the distinction between having THC present in your system and it having any impairment effect is a pretty significant difference. So if you've got a good record, good driving record that is, and there's no evidence of any impairment of your driving, many people plead guilty, most people plead guilty, but my advice almost all the time, plead guilty and the penalty then might be no conviction being recorded and therefore no loss of licence. Okay? Conviction, guilt and conviction are not exactly the same thing. If a court finds you guilty of an offence and the offence is relatively minor and you've got a good record and a few other things, then it can be dealt with under what's called Section 10, the most favourite section, everyone's favourite section really. Section 10 of the legislation means that it can be dealt with, uh, a finding of guilt can be recorded but there is no conviction recorded, okay? If there's no conviction, sorry, I'll go the other way. The, transport, the road transport legislation says if you are convicted of this offence, you must lose your licence for a minimum period of three months. If it's your second offence, or third or fourth, a minimum period of six months. Can be longer, but the minimum periods, three months first offence, six months for a second offence, second or, or later offence, okay? so. What a lot of people have been doing is coming to Lismore Court, and I can say that Lismore Local Court has been uh, uh, overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed with these charges. On some, uh, Monday is the regular day for uh, these kind of cases we dealt with in Lismore Local Court. Um, out of generally 100, 120 odd cases, on some days there have been 50 and 60 and 70 people before the court on this charge alone. So it's reasonably uh, annoying, reasonably annoying to the court, uh, and particularly annoying to other people who before the court to possibly lose their licence. I think it's fair to say that at this stage, most of those people have been dealt with fairly leniently, that is without conviction being recorded, and they've kept their licence once. Once. What the police are doing is once you fail the test once, forget what happens in court, once, the, once you have failed that test, the police know that you have failed the test. Every police car, every police car has a new car computer these days. The police uh, in-car computer has access to their database. The database knows that you have, two months ago or whatever, failed a saliva test showing positive to THC. You might not have got to court yet, but they know you failed that test. Uh, if you drive past that car, a little ping goes off, and they might do a U-turn, pull you over, uh, uh, apply the test again. There's some discussion about these tests being random. Mm, depends what you mean. 
uh, random in the sense they don't need any particular reason to stop you. So in the same way as for the uh, alcohol testing, which has been around for a generation or more, random breath testing, yes, you don't have to be, you know, there's no particular reason why the cops have to stop you. They can set up a, a roadblock kind of arrangement and stop every car going past and that sort of thing. Most of us have been familiar with that. So the, it's random in that sense. They don't need any particular excuse to stop you, but I can assure you it is not random in the sense that it is not a general population exercise. It's targeted. It's targeted to people who drive older cars rather than newer cars. It's targeted to people who have tie-dye t-shirts rather than nice shirts with collars. It's targeted to people who drive combis. It's targeted to people with Lismore addresses. It's targeted to people who are truck drivers. I had a client recently who was pulled over, uh, stopped for the test, uh, uh, they did the breath test, he was fined for alcohol, looked at his driver's licence, saw it was a, a truck driver's licence, said, hang on a minute, went back to the car, came back with the saliva test and tested him because he had a truck driver's licence. He did test positive to methamphetamine. Many people in the room may not be surprised to hear that truck drivers have a bit of a habit of, of using speed while they're uh, at work. He was busted for that. So it's, it's in no way random. And particularly, the second, third, fourth time that people are being stopped because the police know that you failed the test previously and decide to stop you again, maybe a third time, then you are in increasing trouble. Uh, first, because you can't get a section 10 twice. That is, if you, even if you got off the first time without conviction, without loss of license, the second time, even if the circumstances are identical, that is, no impairment, big gap between the smoking of the joint and the driving of the car, whatever it might be, uh, no discretion on the second offence. There must be a conviction, and in that scenario, if it's your second offence, you'd be off the, off the road for three months. If it's your third offence, six months. So increasingly, we are seeing people before the court on their second, third, fourth charge of driving with the presence of THC over a relatively short period of time. Okay. What many people tell the court and what many people, sorry, what many courts accept is that there was a significant time between consuming the drug and driving the vehicle. Had a smoke yesterday, day before, two days ago. People often uh, tell that to the police and the police dutifully record that on the information that gets to the court, the, the summary sheet called a fact sheet that the police prepare. Uh, on a guilty plea, the magistrate sees the fact sheet, the magistrate sees your, your driving record, sees you've been driving for 25 years, whatever, two or three speeding tickets, never been in court before, mm, okay, good record, no conviction recorded. Taking into account that you told the police officer, this had a smoke two days before, how come I see my system? Well, it's there in the system. I'm guilty of the offence of driving with the present, with THC present in my saliva, I'll plead guilty, get some leniency, okay? So many, many people are telling the courts there's two or three or four days space between smoking a joint and driving a car. There is absolutely no reason why a court should not believe that, other than perhaps some common sense, but leave that to one side. Absolutely no reason why a court should not believe that because there is no evidence to say that is not correct. If you, if you go to a court and say, I was driving a car on this day, smoked a joint two days before that, how can the police prove that is not true? And the fact is they can't. Unless you've been under surveillance or whatever, how can they prove that's not true? They can't prove it's not true. So the court is kind of stuck, if you like, with that fact situation, and the prosecution are stuck with that fact situation, and that's how it's been played out. The... I'll just repeat something and then come back to the other case that we had some success on recently. The, remember the law is, no need to prove the intention. They don't have to prove that you intended to drive with the presence of THC. They don't have to prove that it had any impairment effect. They just have to prove that you drove with THC present in your system. I'll take a short aside. Uh, laws around drug, uh, drink driving have been on, on for many, many years, of course. It is not an offence. Sorry, put this another way. Uh, you might remember a few years ago, until they've stopped it now, but until a few years ago, there was fairly common TV advertising saying you could have two alcoholic drinks in an hour and then one every hour after that, and you'd be pretty right, pretty much how they expressed it, in terms of trying to explain to the, the, the community how these uh, alcohol tests would work for drivers. They've stopped saying that because it's not actually accurate enough, but it was never actually a defence to say, well, Your Honour, I had two beers in an hour, followed what the, what the TV advertising told me, drove home and I, and I 
uh, tested positive in the low range. And I was sure, you know, I followed the TV advertising. That has never been considered a defence as such to make you not guilty of driving with a low range prescribed concentration of alcohol. It's, it's just seen as a mistake. You make a, a misjudgment. You've had a few beers, you drive a car, magistrates say this all day every day, never caught in New South Wales and probably a better state. You have, a, you have a drink, you drive a car, you're taking a risk that you're not going to be, uh, you're, going to, you're going to be under the limit, okay? Depends how much you drink, how often you drive and so on and so on, but it's no guarantee, all right? So it, against that background, it's never been the law that you can make a simple mistake in that sense of thinking, oh, I, I should be right, I've only had two beers, that should be fine, uh, because that is not sufficiently a defence, okay? Go back to the case we had a month or two or three ago. We had a case where this was the situation. Fellow was stopped twice. First time he was stopped, he had reasonably, uh, soon after he had a smoke, drove a car, no particular open of this particular offence, stopped uh, by a police officer, tested positive. He said to the cop, how long would it be between smoking a joint and driving a car would I test positive to THC? The cop who was an experienced traffic highway patrol officer, I might say, told him on our client's evidence, told him about a week. About a month later, he was stopped again. Well, kill surprise. He was stopped again and tested again. Having tested positive once, he was stopped again and tested a second time. On his evidence, he said, I had a smoke on the Sunday, this was a Tuesday, the Sunday before last. That is nine days previous to the second driving. Okay? So we pleaded not guilty to that offence. On, on, that, on that basis, and I'll try to explain why as clearly as I can. There is a defence to every charge that if you had made an honest mistake about a factual situation and you had a reasonable basis for believing in that set of facts, and if that set of facts would have made it, if it was, had been true, make you not guilty of the offence, a bit of few uh, legal balls in the I suppose to juggle, if all of those things apply, then you are not guilty. Okay? So in this particular case, we ran the argument, the magistrate accepted that that was the case, that is the magistrate accepted the evidence that there had been nine days between the consumption of the drug and the driving, accepted the evidence that the officer had said that to him, that is, it's a nine day window on the previous occasion, and accepted that that was a reasonable basis for our client to act on that information, that is to think that after nine days he would not test positive. And therefore the charge was dismissed. Um, I think it's fair to say there's been some publicity about that decision and the government is considering whether or not they are, to, are going to appeal that decision. The very interesting thing for uh, this audience and many other audiences is that in response the government A had a bit of a brain explosion uh, I'm told that very, a number of senior police officers are very angry about the decision, so I'm sorry to have to report that to you. But in particular, what, they, uh, what the government said, various government uh, 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 spokespeople, including the Minister for um, uh, Road Transport, whatever they call it, uh, uh, Mr Gay, uh, said, no, 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 that, that can't be right, that can't be right, this is a terrible decision, what's that magistrate thinking about? How could he go with that wrong? It's 12 hours. Look at our website, 12 hours. And let me refer everybody in this room to a website run by the Centre for Road Safety, New South Wales Centre for Road Safety, a little um, section of the Department of Transport in New South Wales. They have a website. On that website, it says the following. It says, we have random drug testing. It says, for THC, typically, sorry, it says, it depends on a number of factors. Your, how frequently you use, metabolism, personal factors, depends on a number of factors. But typically, the test will detect THC up to 12 hours after consumption of, of uh, the drug. So, that's not just said, hasn't been just said once. That's been said over and over and over again. They made one change to that web, the information on their website after the day after the publicity about the court case. They made one change, that was to add the word typically. All right. 
So the current information from the government, the official position of the New South Wales government about how this test works is typically, depending on how much you smoke and what your experience might be, etc., and how much you consumed on the occasion and so on, so a few things in the, in the air, typically you would be testing positive after 12 hours, up to 12 hours. Seems to me that opens up the door to many, 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 many people who might be facing the court on this charge to run the same defence of honest and reasonable mistake of fact based on the following information. You consider yourself a typical cannabis user. I don't know what that means. But anyway, you consider yourself a typical cannabis user. You consider that, sorry, you go, you access this information. That is, you hear the government spokespeople on radio or TV or in the newspaper. You go to the website, you read that information for yourself. It says, well, up to 12 hours, okay? You leave uh, a bit more than 12 hours, not 12 hours and five minutes, but say 18 hours a day, 24 hours after driving, after smoking, you drive a car. It would seem to me that you would have a very strong argument to put to the court that you had an honest belief that the test would only pick up saliva uh, in your THC in your saliva up to 12 hours after you consumed the drug. You waited more than 12 hours, 18 hours, whatever, and you relied on that information and that it was a reasonable thing for you to rely on the information to think you would not pass the test. Not fail the test. Okay? If the court accepts that, you're home and host. You are not guilty of the offence. A couple of things to say. Once that defence is raised, that is, once you put that before the court on any kind of basis at all, not just, you know, hopelessly one meal out, but put that before the court in a proper way, the onus of proof passes to the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you did not have that belief or that it was not reasonable for you to believe that. So they would have to prove that you did not believe what the government told you, that there was a 12-hour window, or that, what the that you relied on what the government told you was somehow unreasonable seems to me proper, a, a properly argued case with that, in that scenario should lead to at least very careful consideration by the court. Magistrate doesn't have to believe you. If you go in the witness box they just don't believe that was 18 hours, say, between the smoking and the driving, you, you, okay, they don't have to believe you. They don't believe you. They don't have to, okay? But if you put that argument, the police have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that it's not true, that is, that you are not being honest, and secondly, that there was no reasonable basis for it. So it requires all those three things. That is, you have to independently find out, not just use your common sense or rely on what your mate told you, you have to independently have a basis for believing that the 12-hour gap is the, is the gap, is the period of time that they, test, they can detect. And secondly, you have to honestly believe that the period of time between when you consume the cannabis and drove a car is at least 12 hours, if that makes sense. At this stage, there's, uh, there, there's an appeal um, cons being considered. We don't know if they're going to appeal or not. Uh, there's been a, another situation where a Byron Bay case, uh, where uh, a spiking case, uh, where at least well, there's one. There's a couple of others around the place, but there's one. Same defence, that is, the person was drinking beer, some idiot mate of his put um, speed in his beer, okay? When she took it to the court, magistrate accepted that was the situation, because I think his mate fessed up the next day. The fellow who consumed the beer thought, well, I've you know, had a beer, I feel a little bit you know, lightheaded, I had a beer, that makes, no, that makes sense. Wasn't over the limit in terms of uh, alcohol testing, but had a, had a beer, maybe a couple. Um, and then tested positive methamphetamine, he said, no, 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 never touch the stuff, that's not me, no, no, no. So the magistrate accepted on the evidence that the uh, amphetamine had been put into his beer and therefore into his saliva without his knowledge. So that driver had an honest belief that he did not have amphetamine in his saliva and had a reasonable basis for it, that is he hadn't consumed it, but that it's not deliberately. Not at all, not just you know, two days before or last month, but not at all. Uh, that is 
we're told that there is no appeal against that decision. That is, the government has decided not to appeal against that decision. But there are a few others that I've heard about where appeals are, or cases where are being held up to decide whether or not particular arguments might work on this particular charge until the government decides whether to appeal our case or not. So there's a couple of cases where uh, in this or district court that are just on hold at the moment. So it's a space to watch, I suppose, over the next few months. Something might happen or might not happen in terms of clarity. But the current state of the law, I'm happy to say to everybody here, in my view, is that the honest and reasonable mistake of fact defence certainly does apply. There's high court cases from the 1940s and after that to say that's the case, in broad principle. And it certainly applies in the drink driving cases. There's three or four or five uh, New South Wales Supreme Court cases that say that you can have an honest and reasonable mistake of fact about a drink, a drink driving case. And again, spiking is the uh, typical case where that's been run. Someone's put you know, vodka in your beer, you didn't think you're over the limit because you're drinking beer, but one beer out of the end of the range because your idiot mate put vodka in your beer. So there's been a few cases like that. So there's no particular trouble about the principle in my view. What is uh, problematic is whether uh, how many people would be believed if you say to the court it's been X number of hours or X number of days between driving a car, between smoking a joint and driving a car? That's very dense information, I understand. I hope that makes some sense. Lastly, the interface, the connection between medicinal cannabis and the driving charges, simple to say, there is no defence at all to say on the driving charge, I use cannabis medicinally, I've got cancer, I've got this serious problem, whatever it might be, I use cannabis medicinally, therefore I should be not guilty. You have THC present in your system, you're driving a car, end of story. The honest and reasonable mistake would not apply to that in that situation because you know you, you contribute THC. Leave aside whether it's right or wrong or just or not just, you would know. Unless it was more than significantly more than 12 hours. So people who are uh, in that uh, medicinal situation where you're using reasonably frequently and so on, uh, you would be uh, unlikely in most scenarios to convince a court that you did not know you had THC present in your system. One last thing before I throw it up the questions. Just want to make it clear about the, uh, uh, the definition of cannabis oil. This is important to some people, I'm sure, in the room. The, uh, New South Wales Administration's Drug Misuse Trafficking Act has a table, a schedule of what uh, substances are prohibited drugs, including heroin and cocaine and all the usual suspects, including cannabis. Cannabis appears in three or four different places on that list. Can ordinary old cannabis, leaf, head, etc. is just called cannabis, cannabis leaf. Okay? And that is defined in the legislation as any part of the uh, uh, genus cannabis, cannabis uh, satiety or doesn't matter what, any, any kind of the uh, genus cannabis. Cannabis oil is defined as a oil, a, a liquid containing THC. So CBD oil that had zero THC is not illegal in New South Wales, if it's purely CBD. Anyone charged with an offence of possession of cannabis oil would be wise to have that properly tested to ensure that they and uh, require the uh, police to test it to ensure there is evidence of THC being present in that substance. If it's only CBD or any of the other hundred, whatever there are, hundreds of other cannabinoids without THC, then it does not qualify as cannabis oil for the purposes of the legislation in New South Wales. So uh, there's been a few cases where that has been successfully argued on the evidence that there is simply no THC present. My understanding though is a lot of CBD oil has a little bit of THC in it, maybe 50-50 or whatever, but sometimes a little bit. If it's got a little bit, a little bit is enough to make it a, an offence. Steve, so that's not the um, health white on the one we sell, it's not a THC oil. That's an oil that's used for health. Yep. As, as long as you can be sure that there's no THC in it, then you're fine. Okay. Uh, look, that's enough for me talking too much. Um, questions, I'm sure there's questions, comments as well probably, that anyone who wants to say something, please put your hand up and we'll cut a microphone to you instantaneously. Even if you're on the other side of the room. See, just while we're waiting to come over, this is a late, stupid question, but does a conviction mean a criminal record is marked? Yes, conviction means criminal record. 
So as a health professional, I'll have yeah. to report yeah. that. The consequences of criminal records depend. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to get sacked or you can never do anything or you can never go overseas. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it means you've got that status of having been convicted and then you're at the mercy of the government department or whether they're going to overlook it and still employ you or not, uh, or let you into their country in the case of applying for a visa. <laughs> My wife mentioned something while you were talking and, and we've had a little discussion um, regarding THC, right? Now, the police don't have to prove whether you have any amount of THC or not to the magistrate. They just have to prove the current law situation that you've got it in your system, right? Until we make this chemical here legal, sir, we're going to be running in our heads into a brick wall for the rest of our lives, right? That's all, sir. It's on my mate's statement. I agree. So Steve, I missed a lot of your talk, so maybe... I'll start again. I'll I'm, start again. I'm sorry about that. So, just to be clear, basically THC is um, in minute amount in everything, in all of it. So even the hemp seed oil, or a hemp seed, has got a minute amount of THC. Because, it, and especially with CBD, Steve talked about CBD, there's no... I don't know any CBD oil with zero THC. And one of the things the pharmaceutical industry wants to do is get all the THC out. But when they do, it doesn't work as well. And that's the thing we're all learning, that, that, that you need a little bit for the whole lot to work on each other. It's the same as whole food. It's the same thing. And the pharmaceutical industry has gone crazy trying to put it in a pill, and they can't. They can't get the THC out. My understanding of how it works is the first test, saliva test, is really shonky. It's unpredictable. I know people who have put a joint out and been tested and immediately ne ne negative, totally. People who haven't smoked have come up positive. The catch is the second test is the same as the third because it gets sent to the lab. And when it's in the lab, they pick up a tiny amount. I don't think hemp seed, but the reason hemp seed is illegal is because the cops think it might interfere. It's that simple. Does that make sense to you, doesn't it? So really, you, if, if you go through the first test, your history. So all the hippies are trying to dodge that. You know, is it white vinegar? Is it apple cider vinegar? Is it vitamin C pills? There's milk. Truckies use milk. There's a lot of stories. A lot of theories, a lot of stories, sort of, um, who knows? I, I have no idea if any of those uh, uh, methods uh, give you any legal protection or not? Is there any process uh, for applying to actually grow on a commercial basis yet in any state? I missed the first part, sorry. Apply for what? Apply for a licence to grow on a commercial basis in any state. No, not for, uh, only for medicinal purposes on a limited basis, very limited basis. Uh, scientific um, research, etc., or for industrial purposes, uh, and for industrial purposes with very, very low THC limits, 0.5% or less, I think is the general standard. So no. Uh, there's been some talk about changing the law, of course, there's always talk about it, but some governments have announced, New South Wales, as you, everyone in the room I think would know, is uh, conducting some chemical trials into medicinal uses of cannabis. The indication is, well, presumably those trials will show that it works, and then presumably the government will change the law in some shape or form, but that's unfortunately still years away before they get to that point. So they've made some general announcements, but they have not changed any law in New South Wales. If I to say something, I'll say something that's a pretty limited uh, application. There is one system for people who are terminally ill in New South Wales. There's a register. If you have a terminal illness and you use cannabis, you can fill in a form, send off to the cops, and you are then basically given protection from prosecution for possession, use, uh, cultivation of cannabis yourself. You can nominate one, maybe two, I think one carer who can also possess, supply cannabis to you. Okay? Last time I checked, there were 50 people in New South Wales on that, this is about a year ago. About 50 people. There's probably a few more than that right now, but it's a very, very limited scheme. You have to provide medical evidence that you are terminally ill, 
and I forget the definition of hand, but that is something like life expectancy of less than 12 months, I think. And uh, you have to trust the system, I suppose, give your information to the police, your name, address, etc. The it, it is, to be clear, it is not legal for you to then possess or use cannabis. It simply means the police know about you in that register and they will not prosecute you. I have not come across anybody who's been prosecuted in breach of that kind of agreement that they you know, give the information and come out and bust you. Haven't come across that, so I think we can trust them. Um, so if you're in that category, you, you've got a terminal illness and you want to um, use cannabis, I'd be getting onto that register. It's called the Terminal Illness Cannabis Scheme, TICS. Uh, New South Wales Police have it. Talk to me if you don't know, if you want to find out more about that after I finish here. Yeah, there's, a, there's a form on the web. They will come and take your plants. They will, will rip your plants out. So the police will come and visit probably. So there are limitations. Sorry, the question is, do you know anything about Queensland? question was about state laws in Queensland. Very similar, um, not exactly identical, similar. Some of the penalties are a bit different, so on, but uh, the same, pretty much the same. Steve, uh, um, I mentioned this earlier, that the human endocannabinoid system is there. We all have it, every mammal has it, and it's to maintain it homeostatus, it's essential. And we, uh, mother's milk, for example, is loaded with THC. Now, if I were to uh, appear in court and state that I had actually suckled uh, and had some mother's milk, how's the court going to deal with that? The, uh, again, it goes on the driving charge. We're talking about driving. Are we talking about driving or what blood offence? We're talking about the driving offence, so drive with presence of THC. The court would have to consider whether or not that was an honestly held belief on your part that you had some naturally produced cannabis, THC, that is that you had not consumed cannabis, hadn't smoked a joint at any time, you know, at any relevant time, so whatever that would mean, and that you had, you had cannabis in your THC in your system because of some natural uh, production. Um, and that you had a reasonable basis to believe that was what the uh, situation was. That is, not that you read it in a, you know, um, I don't know, um, the City Morning Herald or something, no, two years ago, I'm sure I read that somewhere. You'd have to be able to say, look, I, I talked to my GP or I you know, went to, uh, you know, read this book, I, I, whatever. You'd have to be able to point to some reasonable basis, some objectively speaking reasonable basis for believing that you had THC in your system and only for the reason that it had been naturally produced. Okay? In the, you would very likely, I think, need to produce medical evidence to the court or scientific evidence to the court that that is possible. Rather than you just asserting it, you'd probably have to produce evidence to the court before a magistrate would accept that as being the case. So, would, would I be guilty or not guilty? Uh, you could, if you wanted to, well, be mad for you, of course. If you wanted to run the argument that you were not guilty because you had an honest belief you had no THC in your system, yeah. right, then the difficulty would be if you knew that THC was in your system uh, organically, naturally, then how can you say, yeah. I was surprised I, I tested positive? So it's a little bit of a difficult kind of argument in a way. Uh, this law is not, this defence is not meant to be a wide open gate that everybody gets off on. It's not designed to be that. It's, it's, it's a fairly narrow interpret, uh, application. Uh, so I think there might be some difficulty about that. Second thing to say is, one of the reasons why there's been so much publicity about this case is that there is deliberately no information coming from government about what is being tested for. Deliberately. Absolutely zero information. For years and years and years, TV ads that say, anyone's at risk, you know, don't drive, don't take drugs and drive, you know, we'll get you. But they don't give you any information about what exactly is being tested for. That is, what level. The, the report you get back from the lab in the dozens of cases I've done, that don't show any kind of level. It just says THC present. Me, I'm a scientist, know my name, looked at this sample, registration number, blah, uh, slide the test, da da da, uh, I found THC present. Doesn't say any kind of reading. And the government, against that background, has been deliberately, consciously trying to create some fear in the community that anybody who smokes a joint at any time can lose their licence. That's what they want to do. So all the cases, in terms of the courtroom, every single case, 
every single case the, the, the client says, oh, was, you know, the day before, two days before, the prosecutor just sits there and says nothing because they can't prove it's not true. But they don't say, no, 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 that's not possible. Our test is only designed for 12 hours. Not a single, not a single case, not a single word has been said by a prosecutor in any court I've ever heard about what the testing is meant to do, what level is being tested for, what the cutoffs are, not a word. And that's why the um, flurry of activity on the government side and, and they're now being in a sense forced into having to say what it is they're testing for, that is the 12 hour window. Who knows if that's true or not? Who knows if it matters or not? 12 hours after spending the it's a fair bit of time I reckon, but anyway, leave that to one side. So before you talked about um, having to put the onus back onto the police to prove their charge against you. So in uh, Queensland, when you get busted with pop, just doesn't, but medical, doesn't matter, um, you get the charge of possession of a dangerous drug. So you can put it back onto the police as to uh, proving that I have a dangerous drug. I don't know what the charge is in New South Wales. Could you please tell me that? Because I'm now in New South Wales and would like to know. What is that charge? Yeah, what is the charge when you get busted with pot? What is the charge in New South Wales? Uh, the language is different. Prohibited drug is called prohibited drug in New South Wales, not yeah, dangerous drug. So, when you get so charged you're charged with possession of a, a prohibited, prohibited drug, drug. So named this cannabis. This is a different thing. We can't do that here. In Queensland, I tried with the court to put the onus back onto the police and basically pleaded not guilty because they were saying that I possessed a dangerous drug. I don't possess a dangerous drug. It's non-toxic. The, the judge said that she wasn't able to make a decision at that level of the court. Now I'm not don't have the energy to fight and keep going into more levels of and I, on my own. I don't there's I can't find a lawyer that'll fight with me. No, and I look I would say whatever energy you have. The problem is not so much whether we agree or don't agree with that classification or that language. Who cares if we agree that it's not dangerous, it doesn't matter. The law is the law is in Queensland and in New South Wales, the law is it is an offence to possess Cannabis, yes, so okay? They describe it in Queensland as a dangerous drug, okay? Then the driving thing doesn't matter because just having it in the first yes. place yep. is... So yeah. what we need to do is no, go no, no, back no. and no, no, no. Look. and get these guys to prove what they're charging us with. No, no, they, they, they prove that... Prove uh, look, well, that first, no of all, first of all, please stop so I can answer the question. Secondly, please use the microphone when you interrupt me next time. But the problem is that if you're in possession of cannabis, what they have to prove is possession that is something in, in your, either physically, in your, uh, in your pocket or whatever, and or under your control, and that you knew it was a prohibited drug, a, 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 a dangerous drug, okay? The, what the magistrate is saying to you is that he, she or he can't change the law to change that definition. The law says cannabis is a dangerous drug. If you're charged with the possession of a change of dangerous drug, namely cannabis, then that's, he doesn't, it's not an argument to say, well, it's not really dangerous, you know? No, no, no. The, the, the onus doesn't change in that situation. The onus, is a, the onus of proof is on the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt you had possession in your custody, knowing what you had it, and that it was a, a drug that's prohibited under the system. Thank you. Brian. Okay, so I've just got a quick one. I just want to make sure anyone that leaves to make sure to try and hang around for our presentation. We're giving away the programs that have been successful using cannabis for stage four cancer. Okay, we've got. 44 medical records, 6,000 on record. So if you're here for programs, I assume you are, try and hang around for what, this presentation in, in case you go. Steve, yeah, quick, quick comment. Is there a law coming up saying you're not allowed to have uh, books on marijuana in Australia? So I missed that again. Is there a law coming up saying you're not allowed to have books on marijuana or prohibited substances no. in Australia? No, no, no. No, no you, can, you, can, uh, you can read what you like, you can think what you like. You can't smoke what you like. Think what you like. Um, just for something slightly different. Um, there's no two ways about it. That people that smoke marijuana have the same outlook, the same ideology. They're very sensible people. Um, you could almost say they belong to like a religion. Now, um, in a way, what these laws represent are religious discrimination. They, you know, Fred and Ireland Co are the ones that devise them as much as anybody else. So if cannabis um, supporters all started a religion, would there be any grounds for these laws being discriminatory and therefore not, that, not uh, 
fair, not legal, not fair. Uh, short answer, no. Uh, how many years ago, the Church of the Holy Smoke was a... Uh, uh, probably used to meet fairly regularly within these hallowed walls, uh, if I recall. There was a, um, uh, a, probably 10, 12 years ago, Nimbin had a Church of the Holy Smoke, and on that, on that, for that very same argument. He's still joining but, the but You can still join. And, 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 still open, still open to new words. In spite of the fact that the, you know, the, the um, he's sitting in a row with the judge says, that God's law is being applied here, and God said, go forth and eat, you know, uh, look, uh, smoke, in, no. in any... There is a story of a Rastafarian certainly getting leniency. The, the, no, there's probably more one Rasta. Uh, there's a bit of, locally, locally, uh, as in around this and so on, uh, a big myth that if you're Rastafarian then you get off possession charges. There was a Rastafarian years ago, 20 years ago I think, who got a section 10 for a possession charge. He, he just got off on the basis of leniency rather than uh, his religious belief. He probably had, I don't know the details, he probably had a, you know, um, two grams and would have got a section 10 anyway, whether he was uh, just a full-on stoner or, or a religious believer, probably had no real difference, no, no, no difference. But perhaps a bit more seriously, the issue about religious religion and um, any defence, it is not a defence to a criminal charge that you have a religious belief. There are some, constitu some limited constitutional protections about freedom of religion, broadly speaking, freedom of religion, uh, in the federal constitution. One of, them, one of those provisions says that the uh, federal government cannot establish a state religion, like the Church of England in, in the UK, for example, the official religion. So Australia cannot have, constitutionally speaking, an official religion. Secondly, there's a provision that says the government cannot uh, discriminate against a church. Or we can't just do that on the basis of religious belief. The argument that smoking cannabis is a, is a discrimination against religious belief has no legs because it is the practice, it's not the belief that is being challenged, it's the practice. And the gruesome example that makes that very clear is female genital mutilation. There are some religions that, as a religious belief, believe that is the correct and proper cultural thing to do, it is still an offence, in my view quite properly so, still an offence to uh, uh, mutilate uh, uh, female genitalia for religious reasons or otherwise. So you don't get a sort of free kick because you have a religious belief in terms of uh, conduct. You're certainly entitled to belief and you can't be uh, you know, criminalised for what you believe. So you can believe that cannabis is good for you, you can believe that cannabis should be smoked for everybody, you can believe whatever you like, but it's the action of possession or using cannabis that makes you uh, commit an offence. Uh, just a quick one on the uh, hemp seed yep. question. Have you heard of anyone getting busted uh, and saying, well, I only ate hemp seeds, I didn't smoke anything? In and the driving the trace amount in the of driving hemp seeds in there, I'm sorry? In the driving charges? Yes, yeah, specifically, yeah. yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. I have. Uh, it makes no difference. Because what, see, what you have to think about is magistrate having 50 cases to deal with a day, um, hearing 50 excuses a day, pretty much similar excuses, um, doesn't matter. Is there, is there THC present in your saliva? Tick. Were you a driver? Tick. It doesn't matter whether you intended to or not, whether you've had 15, you know, joints the two hours before you drove and you were way off the tree, or whether you had a smoke two weeks previously, whether you had uh, a handful of, of hemp seed on your breakfast, or where it comes from. doesn't matter where it comes from. So it's not about it Where, look, my, this is my opinion, where people get up in court and say, haven't smoked, had some hemp seed on, my, on the breakfast, had, I use hemp seed all the time, magistrate says, yeah, okay, guilty, uh, section 10. No? They, don't, they don't have to explain. They're, they're, they're too busy to explain. They don't have to say, oh no, that's okay. It is not, though, it is not a defence. Okay? Defence means not guilty. It's not a defence. And also, sorry to get back, go back to what I said before about the, just the lack of information, the deliberate lack of information. We don't know what level is being tested at. Uh, pretty sure that the Draga, the second stage test, uh, picks up uh, 5 milligram per 100 mil. That's set at quite a low level, very, very low level. Whole lot, a whole lot lower than uh, workplace testing, for example, which is about 25, 30 uh, 
uh, micrograms per 100 mil. So it's at a very, very low, very low level. Uh, a little bit of, a tiny bit of THC, you know, a few flecks of THC in your um, hemp seed probably would be below that level, in my view. I'm not a scientist, I'm just saying, I, I just really don't think that hemp seed should lead to a positive test. Uh, maybe it would. If it did, if you could convince the court that you had never smoked cannabis, at least for the last you know, months and months and months, your only consumption was, was hemp seed, and you were sure that it had no THC in it, then away you go. Run the defence. Hello, thanks for coming along. Welcome, thank you. I appreciate it. I just want to offer that the um, SecureTech drug bite uh, detects five nanograms. So basically, that's such a minute amount, like the mine testing is 50, and that that's the equivalent of a teaspoon of sugar in the Olympic pill. So basically, it's a ridiculously low level. And uh, I just wanted people to be aware of that because it's certainly not 12 hours, it can be up to 10 days. Thank you. We need to wrap up pretty soon because there's some uh, even more interesting people than me after to keep talking later on this afternoon, so not sure how much time we've got. Maybe one or two more questions, perhaps? I'll keep it short. What can I expect when I refuse the uh, um, saliva test? You can expect to be charged with the offence of refusing to submit to a saliva test, which leads to a penalty which is a bit more serious than failing the test. Uh, that hasn't proved so with uh, um, uh, with uh, um, alcohol or wearing a seatbelt. All depends what you're saying for. Uh, well, it's a, it's, with the alcohol testing, it's an offence to refuse to provide a breath sample and so on. There, there are similar offences. Uh, so, uh, non Deliberately not cooperating is an offence for both uh, alcohol testing and drug testing. And generally speaking, you're not going to be any better off because you know, the penalty is a bit higher for that offence than for uh, failing the test. Steve, we've got two more questions and then we're going to wrap it up. Thank, Thank you so much. You're very good. Okay, so first. Okay, uh, I've got a question about taking CBD with, uh, you know, there's the THC in there. And so can you go to the police station and ask to get tested and see if it's like, you know, all good and stuff and not get, like, done? It'd be a good idea if you could, wouldn't it? Uh, you can ask a police officer at any time if they will test you. I would not be surprised if they said, no, go away, don't bother me. They don't have to. There's no reason why they have to. Uh, those are all um, uh, secure at the first test. They, they're about 47 bucks each, or 40, 50 bucks each. Probably they get a discount, the police probably get a discount for buying 100,000 at a time. But uh, it's, they're reasonably expensive, they're not just going to test you because you ask them to. Is the CBD still illegal anyway? So that's a catch. Yes, that's right. The, the, the difficulty with that is if you're tested positive, uh, in a police station in particular, that would be pretty strong evidence of that you have uh, committed the offence of self-administration of cannabis. That is, it's proving, you're proving to the police you've got it in your system. So therefore, uh, they, they might say, yeah, you're, okay. you, you, you're not okay to drive, and also you're under arrest for uh, consuming cannabis. Last one. Um, because some people do appear to have uh, bad reactions to the saliva test, the actual chemicals on the strip, is it okay to say, I'm not going to put that on my tongue, bro, I'll give you a saliva test by putting your finger in your mouth and then putting, putting the saliva on the strip? In other words, you're still supplying them with saliva. Uh, I had, a, had a, a few situations where that's been put to me. Um, so far, anyway, the police have not often charged the refusal to provide a sample. Okay, so uh, if if they did charge you in that scenario, if they did charge you with refusal, you would have an argument. I would be to say, well, medical reasons can't provide, you know, can't do it because uh, I'm sensitive to the chemicals in the um, plastic thing I want to put in my mouth. So I didn't have a good reason not to. Be a matter for the court, I wouldn't have thought it's a great argument in lots of ways. You'd have to have pretty strong evidence that very, very limited exposure for 10 seconds or so of a chemical on your tongue would cause a significant problem. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I think you just have to have some pretty good evidence to show that it would before that would be an excuse defence to failing to provide a sample uh, in the ordinary way, that is, put this in your mouth for 10 seconds and give it back to me, please. Thank you, Steve. And I must say, I'm very disappointed that I can't go to Amsterdam or international waters and smoke. Well, you can still go to Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Nothing wrong with Amsterdam, just means it's not a defence to uh, the driving charge. 
Thank you one and all. Enjoy the rest of the day.